So uh, up next is Dr. Jason Ong. Uh, he is the Director of Behavioral Sleep Medicine at Knox Health and an Adjunct Associate Professor of Neurology at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. His research interest involves demonstrating the effectiveness and value of behavioral treatments for sleep disorders, including cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness meditation. If you're wondering if there are any treatments that don't involve medications, then this presentation is you. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Ong, and, uh, and, th and please welcome him. Hey, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see everyone here in person. Um, it's always nice to be talking to a group of people rather than like, you know, your screen for Zoom. And, uh, and, and hello to everyone joining us remotely as well. So, um, oops, apologize. Um, let me see if we can get the slides up. This slide, okay. Oh, here we go. Uh, can we, so uh, can we go back one more to the title slide? All right, so, um, so this is who I am, and thank you, David, for the introduction. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, learning how to cope with having idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy, and um, uh, just some of the things that we've learned along the way, the uh, treatment program that we've been putting together, and I'll try to give you some tips uh, for those of you who are people with idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy. Uh, some of the tips and strategies that we've been uh, doing in our program, just so you can get an idea of some of the, the techniques that we're using. So I'll start with this, which is really the question that I get asked a lot, especially by like our peer reviewers with grants and manuscripts, which is why do we need a therapy just for people with IH and narcolepsy? So um, this is gonna be a little bit of preaching and acquired to this group, but uh, as you guys know, um, that there's a lot of research. Uh, most of this is done with narcolepsy, but I think this also applies for idiopathic hypersomnia as well. But yeah, it has a tremendous impact on family, relationships, uh, work, and school. So some of the data here suggests that 86% uh, people uh, with narcolepsy say that it's a life-changing disease, and certainly you guys know about that. Four and five say that living with narcolepsy is a daily struggle. So it really impacts people on an everyday basis. About three quarters say that narcolepsy has affected important moments in their lives. Um, so, you know, they feel that they may not be able to engage in certain important events the way they would like to. And about a third, a little over a third, 37% report actually failing a class at school or withdrawing from a class. So, you know, just the impact it has on education there. Um, now, if you look at the bottom here, more than half of the people surveyed said that uh, narcolepsy is uh, constantly controlling their lives instead of them controlling uh, the, the, the condition. So about 40% say that they do not usually discuss this with their health care provider. Uh, these are usually the physicians that they see about how narcolepsy affects their daily lives. So a lot of times there isn't time to get into some of the psychosocial and emotional aspects of it. Um, almost everyone, 94%, said that uh, new treatment options are needed. And 88% said that people in general don't really understand how disruptive narcolepsy is on a daily basis. And again, almost everyone, 94%, felt that more education is needed. Um, so I'll bring your attention to the middle of that the screen, the red thing, which says, even with treatment, people with, living with narcolepsy continue to feel the impact of their symptoms. So there really is a lot more work we can do to address some of the psychosocial, emotional, and mental health aspects of it. Um, this is a, a nice study where uh, they looked at a large sample, and in this study what they did is uh, they looked at people with narcolepsy, they matched it based on certain characteristics like age, gender, and so forth. Um, so they had these controls, and they were just looking at like how common are these different uh, mental health conditions. And if you just look down the row, you don't have to understand fancy statistics, but if you just look, uh, that people with narcolepsy are experiencing these at much higher rates. In most cases, it's about two to three times. So for example, the top row, their depression, um, people with narcolepsy, uh, there's about 48% of people with narcolepsy who are experiencing depression versus about 26% in the control group. And you can see with like other things like generalized anxiety disorder, it's about 15% if you have narcolepsy, 4% if you don't. 
Um, and then like PTSD, even post-traumatic stress disorder, again, about 15% if you have narcolepsy, 3.5% if you don't. So the point being is that here, the, these mental health conditions are much more common and much more pre prevalent in people with narcolepsy. And this is a nice study by Mary Capella, who's at University of Illinois, Chicago, um, where they looked at the impact of stigma. Um, you know, I think as a lot of you guys know that, uh, in general, the, the portrayal of people with narcolepsy is quite negative by the media and the press. People are seen as being lazy. Sometimes the characters are made fun of. And so they wanted to see, well, what's the impact of stigma? And they found that it does contribute to the feelings of depression. It also has its own direct effects on just their level of functioning. So this is a nice study that sort of brought about that uh, issue of, uh, of health-related stigma and how important it is in terms of uh, functioning here with narcolepsy. So um, next I want to kind of tell you a little bit about the story that we've been doing in this and, and how this research has progressed. So um, really it started with uh, our sleep neurologist. This is back when I was at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. And uh, her name is Margaret Park and she approached me one day and was like, you know, I've got these people with narcolepsy uh, and idiopathic hypersomnia, and they're doing okay on their medication, but you know, we, they really struggle with depression and anxiety. Is there anything you can do about it? And I thought, well, I mean, we don't have a playbook for this the way we do for like insomnia. You know, we have something called cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, but uh, we don't really have anything for, uh, for hypersomnia. So I said, well, send them over and I'll see what I can do. You know, I, I'll at least listen. And that was really the first thing I did, I just listened. And then I realized that, wow, you know, there really is a need for this. And so one of the first studies we did was actually just to do an online survey, just to get a sense of what are the needs, um, how receptive would people be if we tried to offer some kind of behavioral sleep medicine service. So this is just, you know, one of those like proof of concept, uh, the feasibility of that concept, you know, sort of a, if you build it, will they come, you know, just as a starting point. So that's what this study was about. So the first thing is we just asked them about mental health symptoms. Um, here, you know, we weren't looking to see if we could find something new necessarily, but really just does this sample seem to be consistent with earlier studies? And as you can see, um, you know, it is pretty, uh, pretty consistent. There's a high rate of, uh, uh, of these symptoms of depression. The first two, sad mood and loss of interest, are the two uh, cardinal symptoms of a major depression. And about 80% of people uh, with narcolepsy or IH are reporting that. So not really much difference in, uh, between those groups. And then just other things like irritability, social isolation, those are all symptoms of depression. Uh, and then uh, anxiety and worry uh, also um, are uh, at high levels there uh, across both conditions. So this just basically you know, helps to confirm that yes, our sample is quite similar to previous ones and you know, the mental health symptoms are still quite elevated in these samples. So then we started asking questions about like behavioral strategies. And this is really just to get a sense of like, all right, we've heard people using some of these. Um, how common is it? So as you might imagine, using daytime naps uh, is quite common. Um, about 87% of people with narcolepsy, about 81% of people with idiopathic hypersomnia. Uh, scheduled sleep time, what we're talking about here is at night. So some people feel like this falls under sleep hygiene. The idea is to make sure you're trying to get sufficient sleep at night. Um, other things, caffeine, exercise, diet, maybe to a lesser extent with those. Um, and then at the bottom, mindfulness and yoga. So um, of course, I threw these in there because of my personal interest in mindfulness and our research on it. But I was actually kind of interested that, to see that about 20% or so of people were using mindfulness and yoga uh, in, in, as a strategy, uh, presumably to manage stress related to uh, hypersomnia. But it's sort of interesting that they were using this. Now, what really caught my attention is what you see at the bottom there uh, when we asked them, how did you learn about these strategies? And so 78% said trial and error, <laughs> okay? So that doesn't sound very scientific, right? They're, they're just basically winging it. Um, another 44% said the internet, okay? Well, another very reliable source, of course. I don't know, WebMD and Google, like my five-year-old talks about Dr. Google, you know, to see if, you know, he, he needs to go see the doctor. Um, other patients came in third at 38%. And it really wasn't even until we got the fourth place where they got these strategies from a sleep specialist uh, and then a physician, uh, presumably this is like a non-sleep specialist, a, a primary care physician here at 24%. So the bottom line here is that, you know, these, this is not a very scientific approach. This, people are just kind of winging it. Um, and so there, we really don't know if there's any kind of scientific basis to any of these strategies or really anything else. 
So that gave us more motivation to uh, really try to investigate this in a more uh, systematic way. So the next study we did is uh, something that we call a mixed method study. So to explain this to you, um, what we mean here is we have quantitative data, which is what most of us are used to, right? This is like the numbers, is something statistically significant. But we also include qualitative data. So this is different. This feels loosey-goosey to scientists. But qualitative data is where you gather quotes. You look for themes. And what it does is it allows you to go a little deeper to get uh, you know, information that is really, in many ways, more rich. Because you're trying to get the qualitative aspects of, of uh, what they're going through. And I think this is a really good method for investigating things like health-related quality of life. Because I think numbers can only give you some sense. It doesn't give you the full picture. So let me give you some ideas in terms of what people were telling us. So when we asked them about quality of symptoms, um, and, and by the way, I should say, th these are just people with narcolepsy here. Um, and we asked them, like, how did this affect their health-related quality of life? That's what the HRQOL stands for. What they told us is it wasn't just the fact that they were sleepy, but it was the fact that they were constantly sleepy. So this is one of the quotes I really uh, feels connects with this idea that um, this came from one of our participants. She said, people have the perception that you have narcolepsy, you feel just fine, and then you randomly fall asleep. They don't understand it. it's a constant thing. Okay? So that constancy is really hard to pull out when you're just looking at numbers. But when you get these type of quotes, you can hear these themes come out. And also, when it comes to cataplexy, um, it wasn't just the fact that they had cataplectic attacks, it was the fact that they were unpredictable. So this was a, a, a quote from somebody that said, basically what made me go downhill was with my cataplexy, I was walking on campus and there was this long spot on campus that there wasn't really, there isn't really anything to hold on to. And I had an incident in which I went all the way down to the ground. Even to this day, I still avoid that area and it's really taken a lot out of me. So again, you know, hearing these type of things you know, helps us understand a little bit more about what people are going through and how uh, the, this condition and these symptoms are affecting their quality of life. So I talked about stigma earlier. Uh, this came up as a theme as well, where um, uh, not surprisingly, people with narcolepsy felt that the condition was very poorly understood by the public, that in general, they were perceived as being lazy, um, you know, mentioned characters that are funny. Some were even skeptical of narcolepsy as a real condition um, is, is you know, how sometimes uh, they felt like they were perceived. Uh, and so someone said, I feel like people think it's kind of a joke, and they're like, oh, that sounds great. I wish I slept all the time. Right? Well, not very sensitive if you have a condition where you're very sleepy all the time. Um, again, not surprisingly, there was a negative effect on self-esteem and self-efficacy. Um, Self-efficacy, if you're not familiar with this, this is um, feeling like you have the ability to achieve something, to, to you know, accomplish something. So some said they were he hesitant to tell other people about the diagnosis. Uh, others called it an invisible illness. They, some even said they were ashamed of having narcolepsy. Uh, and a lot of people told us that they really felt less capable of doing things, especially in comparison to what they used to be able to do. Um, a couple quotes here, I get tired trying to explain why I'm tired. Right? Uh, and then uh, someone else said, I tend to focus on who I want to be, but I need to focus on who I am. Okay. So I think those are pretty powerful quotes. Uh, we also wanted to ask them about what's going on with your current treatments, what's working and what's not working. Um, again, you know, try to answer that question of like, why are current treatments insufficient for people with IH and, and people with narcolepsy? So for the most part, people seem to be pretty good about keeping up with their, uh, their care. They were going to their doctors, going to clinics about every three to six months. And they said that in general, they were good appointments for discussing medications and symptoms, but there really wasn't enough time to get into the psychosocial aspects, right? So we saw that come up in that earlier slide as well. Um, and uh, this person said, my sleep doctor listens to me, but doesn't provide advice on psychosocial aspects. So just indicating that they're looking for some of this stuff, but just don't feel that there's enough time during these medical visits to do it. There's actually a dissatisfaction with mental health providers. And here they're calling out psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists. They said that many felt their mental health provider didn't understand narcolepsy. Uh, and this really affected their ability to trust, to develop like a, a relationship with their uh, therapist. Uh, one person said, I get so frustrated because I spent an hour in therapy just explaining what narcolepsy is. <laughs> so uh, not a very good use of that hour. Um, and then there were other challenges that people mentioned uh, with accessibility. 
Uh, narcolepsy symptoms created challenges with even going to the appointments. Uh, this person said, I've lost doctors because I could never make it. Uh, I won't wake up. If I, uh, I have nobody to call, I'll turn alarms off. So even uh, engagement in, in accessing treatment is a, has been a problem. Um, and then I, I wanted to show you this. So this is the latest guideline uh, paper that came out, I think it was last uh, September, I believe. Uh, so it hasn't been too long. And what I highlighted here is something in the discussion where they noted that clinicians should be aware that additional non-pharmacological management with workplace or educational disability accommodations, sleep hygiene, and cognitive behavior therapy slash psychological support is often needed to optimally treat patients regardless of drug treatments used. So I think what this points out is that drugs can be helpful to manage some of the symptoms, but to really optimize treatment, you really need to address some of these psychosocial aspects. So again, highlighting the fact, here literally highlighting the fact that we really need to do more work in this area. So basically, you know, the summary here with what we've found is that hypersomnia treatments can reduce sleepiness. However, there's still this unmet need for improving quality of life, uh, reducing depression and anxiety, and in my opinion, making it relevant to people with narcolepsy and people with IH. Um, you know, customizing it to the type of things that we heard from them in the qualitative data. So, you know, we really need a psychosocial intervention just for people with hypersomnia. So uh, this is a study that we did. Uh, I think just talking to some people here, you, there may be people here or, or joining us remotely who might have participated in this or know someone who participated in this. Uh, so this is our, our first attempt at developing what we're calling CBTH, uh, Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Hypersomnia. Uh, we did think about some different names and it became kind of difficult. And like, I also wanted to make sure this is different than CBTI, CBT for insomnia. So it's a very different treatment. These are not the same things. One thing to clarify is CBT is a class of therapy, much like antidepressants or a class of medication but there's a lot of different types of antidepressants, right? You have like SSRIs, you have MAO inhibitors, and they do some different things. They have different mechanisms. So, you know, just to keep in mind that cognitive behavioral therapy is a type of psychotherapy. So, you know, by one of the reasons why we have hyphens and letters after it now is because people have confused things like CBT for depression and CBT for insomnia. So they're very different programs. And in our case, CBTH is also very different than CBTI or D. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll just work our way down the alphabet and keep adding letters after CBT at some point. But um, uh, just to talk a little bit about this study, uh, we're pretty excited about some of the results. So this is all remote delivered. And um, this was actually done before COVID. So uh, we were quite fortunate in that we kind of saw that remote delivery was the way to go, in part because of some of the things we heard, like difficulty accessing treatment. Um, also, we wanted to try to get in touch with and, and, and engage in as many people as we could, and, and we realized that uh, being in Chicago at the time, you know, it, like we could only get that catchment in that Chicagoland area if it was in person. So making it remote, we were actually able to make it, uh, for this study, it, it was a national uh, sample. And we did it both individually and in groups. So you know, at this time, this is really what I would call a feasibility study. We're trying to work out some of the feasibility. Like I said earlier, sort of a, if you build it, will they come? So we wanted to figure out, well, how should we build it? And we weren't sure if individual would be the way to go or groups. So we actually had both types of delivery here. And uh, this is a bit of a busy slide, but what I wanted to show you here is that the way we designed this is that it's modular. And it's modular with these different things like education about uh, CDH here uh, is uh, uh, essential disorders of hypersomnolence. Um, and then other things like self-identity, self-image, uh, structured daytime activities. So I'll, I'll go into and, and unpack some of this as we go along. But the reason we made it modular is because we realized that people with IH and people with narcolepsy have some different profiles with their symptoms and that um, you know, we wanted the clinician to be able to mix and match so that they can customize it, they can tailor it to the patient. So that's the way it's designed. We have kind of a suggested outline here, but the idea is to make it flexible enough that a clinician could customize it to each patient. So that's part of the reason why, in the, for CBT in this case, we, we lumped people with, with narcolepsy and IH. We realize they're different conditions, but we think that the psychosocial impact is quite similar. But this also allows a little bit of customization um, for the condition and also just tailoring it to each patient as well with the individual differences. 
So let me give you a, an example of some of these techniques just so you guys have a bit of an understanding. So um, this first one is what we do in, during the daytime. And um, I'm calling it structured waking. That may not be the best term, um, but uh, in many ways, it's similar to a time management technique that uh, some people call the Pomodoro technique. I actually got that term from a, a narcolepsy patient who talked about this as one of the strategies that he used uh, in terms of taking large chunks of time and splitting up into small chunks of time. So that's something that they usually teach in terms of time management. Um, but also, this is one way that uh, Dr. Park, that sleep neurologist who was at Rush uh, with me, when, one of the things she would tell patients is that you know, most of us think of wakefulness as one long period from the time that we wake up to the time that we go to sleep at night, right? So it's about 16 or 17 hours of continuous wakefulness. But maybe people with IH and people with narcolepsy can't think of uh, wakefulness as being the same way, that maybe we need to break it down into smaller chunks, and that might make it more manageable. So the idea here is to try to do this, um, and, uh, and this is, becomes a method of how you manage energy how you manage productivity during the day. And um, we customize this for each patient. So we sit down, we kind of go through with them, okay, what do you have going on in your lives? Uh, you know, when are you doing things? Uh, we give them a diary as well. Uh, we encourage them to set alarms, uh, use social support to help them uh, stay on track. Uh, I'll just show you a picture here. This is an example of a wake sleep diary. Uh, most of us in sleep medicine are used to sleep diaries. Some call them sleep wake diaries. So I flip this around because we, here we want more information about how people are spending their days. This one is just split up in the morning, afternoon, and evening for convenience. Um, and the naps don't necessarily have to be timed that way, but the idea is just to get like a log of different activities. And once we get about a week or two of this, then we sit down with the person and figure out, okay, you know, what can we do? What can we do to split you know, your big chunk of wakefulness down to smaller chunks? And so it becomes a bit different for each person. Um, and sometimes we have to tweak it as we go along. But, um, but yeah, this way, you know, it's customized and I kind of call it a, a makeover of how you spend your day. So that's one of the things that we do. Um, this is another thing that is called a nurturing depleting exercise. And this is actually something that is used in mindfulness meditation. So there's a program called Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy for depression. Uh, it's actually used for people who uh, have a history of depression and it's used to prevent the relapse of depression. So they use it there to manage energy in the context of depression. But uh, interestingly, I brought this over to the sleep field because people with insomnia actually really like this as well. And uh, I think it's quite helpful for people with uh, hypersomnia as well where we go through, uh, just to kind of walk you through how we do this exercise. So usually what we do is we have people say, all right, I want you to pull out a piece of paper, um, or if it's on a computer, you can pull up like a Word document, and think about all the different activities you do on a typical day, okay? So just think of a typical day and write them down, just a list of these. Um, people usually come up with, I don't know, somewhere between 15 and 25 activities, and you know, I say, you know, you can, List things like get up, uh, brush your teeth, make coffee, eat breakfast. Um, you can go in as much detail as you want. So just to kind of get a menu of what happens during your day. Then after you uh, have this list, you go through each one and you think about whether it's something that gives you energy. You know, is this something that is nurturing? Or is it something that seems to sap energy away? You know, is it a depleting activity? And this is subjective, you know, it's meant to be subjective. It's just your own determination. Um, in some cases, an activity could be nurturing or depleting depending on the day. For example, like when I go to the gym, when I work out, it kind of depends on the day, you know, if I didn't sleep well or if I've had a rough day, maybe it's more depleting. Um, however, you know, a lot of other times, it's actually quite nurturing because it gives me a chance to recharge. So, you know, in situations like that, we just ask people, just make your best judgment on what it typically is. So the idea is that each activity gets an N or a D, okay? Then after that, you count the number of Ns and the number of Ds, and you come up with a total for each. So then, you know, after people have this, and we usually uh, ask you know, someone to, you know, talk about, well, how many Ns did you have? How many Ds you have, all right? And then you come up with this ratio of Ns to Ds. And basically what this does is it gives you a sense of where your energy balance is. So if you have more nurturing activities and depleting activities, you should have a, a positive uh, 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 ratio there, right? It should be greater than one. And that usually means that you're having more nurturing activities, your energy balances, you know, you're, you're having energy come to you. 
On the other hand, if your Ds are greater, then it'll be less than one, then that suggests that your energy transactions are, are kind of you know, getting away from you, meaning like you're, you're, you're more spent at the end of the day. So this just gives people a way to just gauge like, you know, with what I'm doing on a typical day, like where's my energy going? And then we walk them through some ways that they might be able to rebalance this. So, you know, we have them take a look at their activities and say, hey, you know, with the ends that you have, um, are there ways you can do more of it? So, for example, if taking a walk is an end, uh, you only take one walk a day, can you take more than that, even if they're smaller walks, right? So there can be some creative ways to try to rebalance this. Um, same thing with the Ds, like, okay, do you have to do this every day? Or could you do it every other day, every third day? Um, and in, in some cases, you know, if it's more subjective, like that exercise uh, example I gave, is there a way, you know, can you notice a pattern in terms of like, uh, how do you approach this activity? Is there a way to approach it in more of a nurturing way? So we try to be creative in terms of helping people find ways to rebalance their, uh, their energy transactions. And I just say anecdotally, people seem to really like this activity because there's really not a whole lot that people talk about in terms of helping manage energy during the day. So um, this seems to be kind of a crowd favorite. Uh, a few other things that we do. So um, you know, there are some self-efficacy uh, strategies. Um, this is where we, we kind of process some of these questions with people. Uh, if, this is where it varies quite a bit in terms of like how long people have been diagnosed, whether they've kind of gone through this process, whether it's on their own with family members, support people, or maybe with a therapist. But the, you know, do we ask them, like, have you thought about what it means to have IH or narcolepsy? Um, has anything changed for you? Uh, bringing in some things from kind of a mindfulness and acceptance perspective, like um, helping them define their values. So is it possible to still um, hold true to some of the values that are important in your life uh, and be somebody with narcolepsy? So kind of this being the person you are now, uh, as you heard so, like one of the quotes before, and not trying to be someone who you were or someone who you want to be. Okay. Um, and then uh, this idea of emotion-focused versus problem-focused coping. So this is something that's used in people with chronic pain. Um, it's usually used in, in uh, people that are encountering situations where they can't really change um, you know, the situation. So this idea of riding the wave. So in chronic pain, sometimes we tell people like, well, if it's like a really bad day with your chronic pain, maybe you pull back on your activities um, and scale things down. But then like if you're having a day where you're more, you have either less pain or even if you're pain-free, maybe you try to do a little bit more that, that day. So you kind of ride the wave and sort of take it day by day. So th sometimes that's one way to kind of deal with it. Uh, if there are other ways to solve the problem, like with the uh, nurturing depleting activity, we try to uh, do some of that as well as far as problem-focused coping. And then social support, um, so if they haven't had a chance to do this, we might provide some uh, training on talking to others about IH or narcolepsy, uh, things like assertive communication, um, other things that I know uh, programs like HF uh, and others uh, provide some helpful tips about how to talk to doctors, uh, how to prepare for your doctor's visits, things like that, and also uh, disability accommodations, uh, if that's appropriate for the person. Um, talking to family and friends, you know, sometimes just encouraging people that asking for help is okay. I know it's really hard. Um, but you know you can do it in a way that helps to facilitate help and, and communication. Um, so just helping them out with that. And a lot of people really like the social connection. This is where like the group, the people who receive the group delivery, seem to really like meeting others with IH and narcolepsy. Uh, sometimes people who got the individual said that it would have been nice to be in a group. But uh, there was this theme that uh, the social support was quite important. So let me show you uh, some of our data that we got from this study. So uh, over on the left is a PHQ. This is a measure of depression. And uh, the blue is baseline, and then the, the red is post. So you can see for both the group and the individual, we did get a decrease in the depression scores, uh, suggesting that people have uh, fewer or less intense symptoms of depression. Um, this is statistically significant for what it's worth. Usually in a, a small pilot study like this, we don't focus quite as much on statistical significance. Um, but this at least is consistent with sort of that proof of concept that it looks like um, people are uh, improving in terms of their depressive symptoms. On the right, what we did here is we drew what's called a clinically significant response. In the case of depression here, it's a decrease in that PHQ score of at least five. So this is a cutoff that's been validated in research as a clinically significant response. So in other words, it's something that's meaningful. And we had this pre-specified benchmark meeting 
you know, when we went into this, we, we thought, well, if we can get like 50%, half of our sample to have this clinically significant response, it means that this is working pretty well. That's kind of what we're hoping for. So we did hit that mark with the group uh, delivery. Uh, we fell a little bit short here with the individual. So again, that's sort of consistent with what I said earlier that uh, the people who had that group, uh, especially I think that social support, did seem to have some, um, some benefits there with their depressive symptoms. So this is encouraging for us. Uh, another measure that we use is something called the PROMISE. Uh, this is a patient-reported outcome measurement information system, I think is what it stands for. It was developed by uh, the NIH. Uh, it was a, I should say it's an NIH-funded project that uh, the NIH supported. And here, what we're doing is, in a sense, looking for a psychological assay, if you will. So these are different scales that they have, like depression, anxiety to the first two. Uh, then there's other things like with fatigue and so forth. But what we're looking for is, on these scales, would any of them reach a, a certain measure here that is of a, an effect size? So what this is is that the degree of change that you see from the baseline to the post-treatment reaches something that in statistics we call a medium effect size. That was sort of our benchmark here. That's what that line over there uh, is. And we did find that this GSE did. And GSE is general self-efficacy. So the way I tend to think about this data is, these data is that um, this suggests that uh, what we're kind of hoping is that what we're doing here from a psychological standpoint is really improving people's self-efficacy. And this is sort of that, um, you know, the mechanism or the psychological assay, if you will, of what seems to be happening. So again, a little bit of data that's consistent with some of our theories and hypotheses in this area. Uh, okay, so then just the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, something that we were trying to develop, uh, which was an app for narcolepsy, uh, and really for narcolepsy and IH, uh, that the idea behind this really was to be kind of a personal manager. Uh, in our study, one of the things that people found challenging is that they liked the sessions. You know, we did this about once a week, um, and, uh, and it was a six session uh, 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 treatment uh, was what CBTH was. But they said that, you know, in between, sometimes it's still hard to keep up with some of these things. So we thought, well, if they had an app, you know, nowadays people have apps, wearables, you know, that basically this is how our lives are managed now, right? Our phones tell us what to do. Um, you know, if we could have that and, and have, you know, the, the apps like have push notifications and reminders, this might be a way to kind of get into people's lives in a way that we can't quite do when we're having these sessions uh, on a weekly basis. So we were trying to develop this. Um, we even had some of our things like our nurturing depleting activity that people can do in the, the app, um, you know, reminders that they can set, things like that. So um, you know, this, uh, this is a, a project that uh, has sort of been halted since I've left Northwestern, unfortunately. Um, I think, as far as I know, all of that stuff is still there. So if anybody is interested in continuing this, I'm happy to hand over the keys. Um, and it, it's kind of too bad that uh, we didn't have a chance to fully uh, implement that. Um, but um, yeah, I know that there's some other groups out there trying to develop apps. So hopefully, you know, whoever can do it, I think it could be a real service uh, to, to patients in this area. Um, the last area I wanted to talk about is mindfulness. And you know, as you guys probably know, many of you guys probably even use some of these uh, programs. There's like a ton of different mindfulness apps now. Um, as you might know, uh, you know, some of the key elements for mindfulness are awareness, non-attachment, and this last one, self-compassion. So this is the one that we thought might really be useful for people with hypersomnia. And you know, I showed this slide earlier, so we wanted to see if self-compassion can, can help excuse me, with some of these things uh, in terms of like the stigma, uh, self-esteem, and so forth. So a little bit different way to approach uh, this problem and we had this crazy idea that we could actually teach people with narcolepsy to meditate. Um, you know, we, it was challenging trying to convince a grant review committee <laughs> you know, that we could do this, um, but we actually got this funded by the NIH. Uh, so this is a study we call the ASCENT study. So again, some of you out there may have participated in this. Uh, I think we've actually finished uh, uh, data collection and, and uh, we finished enrollment for this. But basically, we're trying to see if mindfulness uh, meditation delivered in these different programs, um, a four week, an eight week, or a 12 week, could be useful. We had these different uh, durations because we weren't quite sure what would be feasible and for people with hypersomnia 
Um, you know, could they actually do a traditional eight week program? That's how long these meditation programs typically are. Do they need to kind of shorten it into four weeks or extend it out to a 12 week? Um, so that's kind of what we're testing. Um, we don't have the data yet, at least the quantitative data. But what I, uh, this actually comes from a colleague of mine, uh, Jen Munt. So she's actually taken over as the principal investigator of this study. She's at Northwestern. And so we've looked at some of the, uh, the qualitative data here. So again, this is why this is important. So these are some quotes, and I really like these. Uh, the first one is, I like the breathing meditation and compassion meditation because I feel like I'm hard on myself a lot. People with narcolepsy tend to be hard on themselves. It comes with the stigma people give us. So the person said, I'm less critical of myself for sleeping and taking naps. Um, and in this last one, it's hard to be easy on ourselves, especially when the symptoms are perceived as laziness, to just put a hand on your heart and say, hey, this is rough and you're not alone, it will be all right. I thought that was really powerful. So, you know, it, I think this could be another way to help people, uh, you know, deal with self-esteem uh, and then some of the stigma. So uh, we're in the process of analyzing the data for this study. So hopefully um, over the next few months, we'll be able to report what we found. Oh, and uh, my colleague, uh, Jen, wanted to let people know that uh, she does have another study. Uh, I think this one is just an online survey. Uh, I'm not involved with this, so I don't actually know too much about what, uh, what's involved. But uh, here is the information if you uh, want to uh, uh, read more about it. Uh, there's also an email. Uh, it's called the Explain Study, so explain at northwestern.edu. Okay, so let me just wrap up here. Um, you know, I think right now we're hoping that new programs uh, for coping with hypersomnia will be here soon, uh, but they're not quite here yet. So in the meantime, what can you do to get help? Um, the first thing, of course, talk to your doctor, right? So they are good resources. And let them know that you're struggling with mental health or you need uh, some assistance in coping with uh, narcolepsy or IH. Um, luckily now, like, there's less stigma around mental health in general. So I think people are starting to feel a little bit more open talking about mental health. Um, the other thing is ask to see a BSM provider. So BSM here is behavioral sleep medicine. Um, and there are telehealth options. And so I wanted to show you this. So there is a society of behavioral sleep medicine for people like myself. These are mostly sleep psychologists. There are also social workers, some physicians and nurses in there as well. Um, but we actually have like a map here of different providers uh, and different members in different states. I think there's actually one, uh, there's an international one as well. So uh, this is really useful. You can you know, click on your state and see if somebody uh, is available. And now with telehealth options, um, you know, we, I think you can actually practice interstate in certain areas. I know psychologists can do that. There's actually this, this pack that allows them to do that. Um, and then if you are working with a therapist, uh, tell them about CBTH. Uh, we make our treatment manual for that study available to any professional upon request. So I do get them. In fact, I got an email just a couple days ago from a rehab psychologist uh, up in New York. So, um, you know, uh, tell them to, to, to get in touch with me or, or uh, Dr. Mont. Uh, we have those. So finally, just uh, acknowledgement to all the study participants, uh, the people who've helped us uh, fund our research, uh, as well as recruits, uh, the people involved. And uh, I think there's still a few minutes left for uh, questions, if anyone has any. So thank okay, you for your time. Okay, I have the mic for questions. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Um, I had a chance to collaborate with Dr. Munt on the, on the survey that you mentioned, so if anybody has any questions, right. I'll be happy to answer that. Um, it was a secondary view, viewpoint um, from the patient perspective, but happy to okay. answer any questions with that. But I, I wanted to hear about your perspective on the importance of small groups when it comes to people with narcolepsy. I have a chance to facilitate groups uh, for, for wake up narcolepsy, and I found that it's probably as important as any component or strategy in my life outside of medication and naps in terms of navigating my symptoms. So what are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, small groups are probably a really good way to go. Uh, sometimes large groups can get a little overwhelming, but I, I, it does seem like that social aspect is quite important. Um, I think just anecdotally, uh, some Perfect. of the quotes from that ascent study also were consistent with you know, what I showed you guys with the PATH study. 
So yeah, uh, you know, it's funny from a scientific standpoint, we've actually talked about support groups as just being a control condition, but we're a little scared that, you know, that's actually a pretty powerful, uh, you know, condition. So it may be too strong of a control condition. It may not really be like a inert uh, kind of group. So, so yeah, I definitely think that social support is helpful. And I think just, you know, a lot of people have commented that it's the first time they've met somebody else with narcolepsy or IH. And just to have that type of relationship and to know that they're not alone is quite powerful as well. So I think there's a lot of benefits that can come from a small group. Yeah, so, so thank you for doing that. Um, we have a, an easy question, hopefully, from online okay. and thankfully short. Um, where do you think is the best resource to find physicians that understand IH? Best resource to find physicians that understand IH. Uh, or therapists. Um, well, I mean, probably a good starting place would be to go to an accredited sleep center. Um, so the American Academy of Sleep Medicine uh, does accreditations. You know, they have to meet certain standards, one of them being, you know, that they understand how to diagnose and treat all sleep disorders. So I would probably start there. Um, I mean, besides that, I believe uh, Hypersomnia Foundation also has a list of providers, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I think those would be two great places to start. Um, I think, like, you know, to the point about other connections, like social groups and so forth, sometimes if you connect with someone in your area, uh, that might be another way, you know, in terms of word of mouth. Yeah. Uh, do we have another question from in person? Okay, Chris. Oh, there we go. I missed the hand. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Quick question. Where can patients get the wake sleep? Um, you had a slide and it had a, the, is it downloadable for people to use that at home? The, that wake sleep diary that yes. I showed? Um, I don't think we have it downloadable, although I think we could pretty easily make that happen. Um, I had to check with my, with, with Jen Munt at Northwestern, she may or may not. Um, but it's just something we kind of created. Um, so yeah, there was nothing particularly special about that. We just, by convenience, kind of mm -hmm. split up the day into like these three sections. I think others, I've worked with some patients who I think just created their own. They sort of use ours as a template. Um, and, and that's kind of what we we're hoping like with the app is that, you know, you could then customize it in terms of how you want to split it up. So, um, so yeah, I guess short answer is we don't have it available now, but we could certainly develop it or make it available. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. And then I think this is the last question. Um, what is the contact info for therapists to reach out and get the CBTH manual? Ah, okay, good question. So they could uh, either email myself at my Northwestern email account. So uh, it's just jason.ong at northwestern.edu. So just first name, dot last name at northwestern.edu. Um, it'll send you a very cryptic auto reply <laughs> that sort of indicates that I'm not there in a cryptic way, but I do check it. Um, it's just my way of screening for stuff. So yeah, if they ask for, like, and so this is where like when professionals ask for you know, the, the treatment manual, I do send it to them. Um, or Jen Munt, you could probably reach her, I think at probably that um, explain at northwestern.edu. Uh, I think also for the ascent study, there's an auto reply that will give you the email address and, and that does get routed to either myself or, or Dr. Munt, yeah. All right. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.